Hi, everybody. So, post-enlightenment. I remember a year ago, after attaining fourth path, I was wondering, how the heck am I going to continue to live without a mind, without an eye, without an identity, <laughs> without a plan? How am I going to continue to live in this crazy society that demands that you have an ego and a social group and so on like this? I mean, on the one hand, I wish I had a social group. I wish I had a group of friends that I could actually trust. But what has actually happened is that again and again and again, every time I approach one of these organizations, they reject me. So. What's going on with that? In Buddhism, uh, there is an established belief, which was not taught by the Buddha, <laughs> but it's an established belief that once you attain Arhan, you have to become a monk. You have to ordain within two weeks or you'll die. Well, of course, that's nonsense. But let's look into it for a minute. Why is it that a person like myself, who has experienced enlightenment and then disappeared, <laughs> how can an organization then demand, oh, you have to join us or you're going to die? Well, they want to control. They want to control the way enlightenment is perceived, the way our hunts are perceived. And of course, they want to control the arhats themselves. You don't want them going around saying stuff that might, you know, blow their cover. So, of course, all it had to, all they had to do was poison a couple of new arhats, and then people would start to believe it. Huh? Very easy to do. And that way, they created another superstition, another religious fabrication. Why? to protect the value of the organization. In other words, the organization is more important than the individual. The individual is there to serve the organization, not the other way around. And that's what's wrong. Organizations should serve the individual, should promote, protect, and facilitate their self-realization. But the fact is, if you become self-realized, no organization wants you. In fact, they're going to do their best to rub you out. So this is true of the Hare Krishnas. This is true of Buddhism. It's even true of the Rajneeshis. Huh? Oh, so the Osho lovers. <laughs> they put it in such beautiful language, you know. And actually, Venkatesh Rao made this point in his newsletter this morning, he says that organizations, especially religious organizations, are based on an ontology, an epistemology that's basically nonsense. Uh, it's a fabrication, and then it's obvious to anyone who looks at it in an unbiased way. In fact, everything is nonsense. This is nonsense. What I'm saying is bullshit. Anything you say is bullshit. Because words aren't things. Ah, the light goes on in somebody's mind. Words aren't things. So anything you say, especially about intangible stuff, subjective stuff like enlightenment, consciousness, and so on, is bullshit. It's nonsense. You can say anything. Uh, look at Trump. He said this, quote unquote, a couple years back. I should run for president. I could say anything. Those idiots would believe it. My numbers would be great. <laughs> Why? Because he's got an organization. Organization equals credibility in today's society. If you don't have an organization, you're considered a nutcase. A lot of people consider me a nutcase. But guess what? They don't ever come to me and debate. They don't ever challenge my philosophy. They only dig up the dirt in my past, or what they think is dirt, and broadcast that. That's stupid. 
And anyone who's intelligent can recognize how stupid that is. Huh? If I'm really an arhat, I should be able to defend my philosophy. And I can. The thing is, nobody attacks my philosophy. <laughs> they know they, they don't even understand it. What to speak of have any argument against it? <laughs> what do they do? They attack me socially. They attack me uh, by character assassination. They attack me in all kinds of ways, even physically. But they never, never, ever try to defeat my philosophy or my teaching, because they can't. And that would make them look bad. That would decrease their organizational value. Huh? So really, what it's all about is the donation box. If people like me acquire credibility, theirs goes down. I'm saying the individual is the measure of enlightenment not the organization. Organizations exist by exploiting the individual, huh? by taking the individual's assets and claiming them for their own, and then using that individual to generate more value, not for the individual, but for the organization. This goes very deep in our society. Huh? The whole corporate mindset which is, of course, is complete nonsense. A corporation doesn't even exist. What to speak of having all the rights of a person? That's what to talk about bullshit. Huh? A corporation has more rights than an individual in our society. That's nuts. So, these people are de facto nuts, insane. Huh? And they're calling me nuts for being enlightened. What can you say? I mean, what really could... <laughs> Just ignore them. That's what I do. I do my best. Unless they interfere in my day-to-day -day life, I more or less just ignore them. Because all they can do is manufacture bullshit. That's all an organization does. They have a whole organization of scholars. Huh? These are people with advanced degrees going to school for years and years. Why? Just to learn all the arguments to prop up the organization. So an individual has a hard time and therefore a lot of people just cave in and they get into these organizations, these religious organizations, and allow them to exploit them, thinking that, oh, well, I can ignore the exploitation part as long as I can go on with my sadhana because they're hungry for enlightenment. That's why they joined the organization. So they put up with the exploitation, they put up with the nonsense and the bullshit. And what happens? They don't get enlightened. <laughs> Isn't that something? I didn't get fourth path until I disrobed as a monk. They're saying, if you, uh, if you become an arhat, you have to ordain, you have to become a monk within two weeks. I'm saying, I disrobed, I left the monkhood, and then I got forced past our hunship. You see? They turn everything upside down, backwards, inside out. Huh? They invert everything. And, and the Buddha calls them out on this. Huh? In the Shurangama Sutra, it's a Mahayana Sutra, he calls them out on this. He calls it inversion. He says, the first inversion happens when you start to accept symbols as truth. In other words, you can say anything in words. You can say the horns of a hare, huh? the horns of a rabbit. Now, the horns of a rabbit, of course, don't exist. Huh? I mean, there might be some horny rabbits out there, but they only have one horn. <laughs> so, the horns of a rabbit, you can say it, but it's not real. Um, the wings of a horse. What? You know? Come on. This is how screwed up words are. So don't accept anything that people tell you, but do the experiment and find out for yourself. If you do, you'll find that 99% of everything these organizations tell you is bullshit. So you can't survive on a diet of bullshit.
even sacred bullshit. <laughs> In India, cows are sacred. So their shit's also sacred. Actually, it does, you know, it does have enzymes that destroy bacteria. And that's why it's uh, used in sanctifying temples and like that. But come on, you know, it's still shit. So here we have all this holy sacred bullshit and organizations prepared to use force against people like me that call them out. Is that religion? Apparently it's what passes for religion. That's why to me and to a lot of people, religion has become a dirty word. But unfortunately, most people, most skeptical people, throw the baby out with the bathwater and they deny enlightenment simply because it's propagated by these stupid religions. Don't do that. Enlightenment is real. In fact, it's more real than non-enlightenment. Even your so-called freedom that you get from skepticism is only relative you're still imprisoned by a bunch of ideas and concepts. Until you can get beyond concepts altogether, realize that all concepts are bullshit. <laughs> you can't become enlightened. Now here's the thing. All these organizations are selling you something. Whether it's an idea, a path, a method, a god, a form of worship, or something like that. They are trying to tell you you come to us, we'll act as an intermediary for you. Uh, we'll take care of your problems. And as I said yesterday, this is a mafia business model. Uh, and it's been going on for thousands of years. There's nothing new. There's no innovation in it whatsoever. Now the Rajneeshis are becoming just like the Orthodox religions, you know. You can't say anything critical about their leaders or they'll attack you. And guess what? They'll blackball you, put you on a blacklist, and then you can't go to any of their centers anymore. Ooh, that's nasty. But these are nasty people. They're nasty, mean. I had a conversation with one yesterday online. He was so mean and evasive. He wouldn't answer any of my questions. Just quote Osho. Come on. Osho has deliberately, he's quite deliberate about saying something from both sides of any issue. Huh? One time he'll say, homosexuality is a perversion, and it's below human, and they're no <laughs> so on like that. And then another time he'll say, hey, however you want to express your sexuality is fine. It's not a crime. It's not a bad thing, especially if you don't take it seriously. <laughs> so you can find something in Osho somewhere or other to uh, back up any point of view. And of course, even the, the real quotes by Osho, they misuse. The real instructions of Osho. Like, don't believe in any organization. <laughs> and then they go off and not only they start one organization, but many organizations now all over India. So anyway, these people can be safely ignored. Unless they start to interfere in your personal life, then you do what I do. You go to the police. I have an ongoing case collecting evidence at this time. So if anybody gets any nonsense, uh, offensive emails or messages from these people, kindly inform me and we'll just add it to the evidence that we're collecting. The case is registered with the police here. They, I'm registered with the police here. So anybody that tries to mess with me here is going to walk into a trap. And they don't know where I am either. Nobody knows where I am. <laughs> I could be anywhere. I could be in India, Sri Lanka, any place with a beach. Huh? So look at it. These people cannot touch me. They cannot mess with me. All they can do is post bullshit online. Hey, but my stuff is also bullshit. So what's real? What's real is the experience of enlightenment, the experience of meditation. One of my friends, very intelligent boy in Germany, he's been knocking his head against the wall for years 
trying to do classical Buddhist meditation. And he's not getting anywhere. So I tell him, look, maybe this is not for you. Maybe this step-by-step -step process isn't going to work for you. You Try the Zen shortcut. Instead of closing the mind and narrowing the attention in concentration, open it wide. Uh, just let whatever is going to come, come. But you don't pay attention to that. You turn the attention around and look at yourself. Look at you. Not the body, not the mind, not the thoughts, not the experiences, not the perceptions. None of that. Your awareness. Pure awareness. What's the difference between awareness and consciousness? Consciousness has an object. You can say, I am conscious of something. There's a subject, an object, and a relationship. Whereas in awareness, awareness is potential consciousness. Awareness doesn't need an object. There's a wonderful sutta where Shariputta is explaining to Ananda, there is a state of samadhi, of concentration, where you have no object. The thoughts are arising, the thoughts are passing away. Perceptions are arising, perceptions are passing away. But you're not paying any attention to that. You're simply awareness, without any object. Or awareness being aware of itself. That's enlightenment. So simple. Just open the mind, allow everything to happen, and be aware of your awareness. It's so simple. One step. Like Osho says, there's only one path. The path goes this way and the path goes that way. <laughs> so you can walk this way outwardly on the path toward the world, toward the senses, the mind, all that junk. Or you can just turn around and walk the other way. Same path, but now you're going deeper and deeper and deeper in yourself until you come to the core, which is nothing, emptiness, pure awareness. So what do you got to lose? Well, you got your organizational prestige and you got your, your network and, you know, you got the people who are paying you money to keep them illusioned and deluded. That's a good one, huh? Hey, you pay me money, and I'll teach you all this nonsense, and uh, it won't get you enlightened. It'll get me rich, but you see what I'm talking about? It's a game, folks. It's a game. They spend all this time and energy propping up these nonsense teachings and claiming them to be the absolute truth. Huh? And if anybody says anything wrong, oh, they jump all over you. Huh? So, is there really an absolute truth? No, I don't think so. I can't find one. All truth is relative. The way I'm talking to you right now wouldn't make any sense to somebody born a century ago. And it probably wouldn't make any sense to, to someone born a century from now. Huh? Read some old English literature or poetry if you speak English, Chaucer, or somebody like that, huh? It's tough going. <laughs> Even the original Shakespeare is difficult to read. And that's only, what, 300 years ago? So, the vernacular I'm using now will be obsolete in a couple of years. That's all right. So will I. <laughs> but I don't care. That's the difference. I'm not worried about it. Because awareness is always there. Awareness is eternal because it's an emptiness. It's a nothingness. It's a lack of something. A lack of thingness. A lack of becoming. There is no more becoming in Nibbana. That's one of the definitions of Nibbana. That state in which there is no more becoming. 
I would say mm, that there is no more forced becoming. We're no longer forced by karma to become something, to enter into the round of birth and death again. We're no longer forced. If we want to, we can. And do it deliberately. Become what we want to become, not what our karma forces us to become. That's enlightenment. That's Buddhahood. And everyone is a Buddha. Huh? I mean, it astounds me that the Tibetans, for example, Dalai Lama's crew, huh? homeboys from the Himalayas, <laughs> I mean, they can even justify killing somebody. Or like my friend David Chapman received letters threatening that he would be kidnapped and tortured by the Tibetan monks for his teachings, his views. As far as I know, he doesn't even teach, but he writes stuff and they don't like it. So they're threatening him. Why? Because what he's doing undermines their bullshit. It directly contradicts the restrictive measures taken by the Tibetan Buddhism to stop the teaching of Tantra in the West. Why? They, want to, they say they want to keep the tradition. Huh? But the tradition is completely different from the origins of Tantra. If you read about the origins of Tantra, they weren't just imagining having sex. They were really having sex. <laughs> but now, oh, no, no, you can't do that anymore, see? You can only imagine. Because we're the, we're the good guys, we're the Buddhists, we don't have sex, we're religious. Yeah, yeah. Bullshit. I'm going to call bullshit on this. Look, if Buddha can attain enlightenment, anyone can attain enlightenment. If Saraha and all the other tantrikas can attain enlightenment, I can attain enlightenment. Because I'm doing the same things. So where are they do what they're doing is defending their false tradition. Their see this is modernism. Modernism is you take a tradition, something that actually worked for people in the past, and then you formalize it and you make it into a religion. And of course it doesn't work anymore, but now you have a normalized standard view of the practices and so forth. And then you can enforce that on people by a religious organization. Whereas if you have everybody running around doing whatever they want, of course, there's no way to profit from that. <laughs> there's no way to create value, create a, a power center or a profit center. To do that, you have to have something standardized. So anyone who deviates from it can be suppressed. That's the origin of organizational power and persecution. That's why they're on my case. That's why they're on David Chapman's case. That's why, like he says, death threats are the minimum fee for entering a sincere discussion on the internet. That's, that's the, the base price. huh? If you say something real, you're going to get death threats. Not from individuals acting on their own, but from organizations who program these individuals to react like that. It's a cultivation of hate. Look at the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, look at the so-called uh, religious right in America. It's just a hate group. But because it's a majority hate group, a majority religion, then they don't get called out for it. But it's still a hate group, by any other name. You call it whatever you want. What are they doing? What they're doing is trying to suppress individuals. And you'll find that in every religion, in every organization, in every corporation, in every social group. There is a class of people that they are against. And who are those people? They're the people who tend to unmock their conceits, who undermine their theories who call them out on their bullshit. You can't call me out on my bullshit because I admit what I'm saying is bullshit. Huh? 
Everything, anything you can say is bullshit. <laughs> Especially on this subject, enlightenment, post-enlightenment. So now, a year after my enlightenment, I can say, because I've traveled all over South Asia, going to different temples, different groups, and none of them will accept me. So, if you are enlightened, you are automatically locked out of any religious group, of any community, of any uh, support, social support. You become a loner. Nobody's going to support you. Unless, of course, you bow down to the organization and agree to play by their rules. And no, one, no actual enlightened person is going to do that. Because we know. We know what we are. Huh? There's no doubts. That's the whole thing about enlightenment. You get it and all doubts are finished. Even after first path, I doubted. Even after third path, I doubted myself. It wasn't until I got fourth path that it was like, okay, this is it. And no doubts. That is impossible for an organization to deal with because they use your doubts. They exploit you. Your doubts are like an opening where they can penetrate your mind and exploit you because you're doubtful. Huh? You should get more doubtful. You should get really doubtful, not only about yourself, but about them too, about everything. Doubt is great. Skepticism is great. Because, I'll tell you what, if you're skeptical about something, if you're able to say no to something, I would say um, about 95% of the time you'll be right. Whereas if you say yes to everything, huh, you'll be destroyed. They'll come and exploit the hell out of you. The minute you say yes, the minute you open up, these groups are dangerous. They're dangerous to your spiritual health. They're even dangerous to your physical health. What to speak of your emotions, your relationships. I don't know any married couple that survived becoming Rajneeshis. I don't know of anyone. Huh? Any couple that came into that commune was torn apart by sociopaths. Okay, their relationship may have had problems, but that's no excuse to destroy it. Why don't you help it? See, if you really know so much, if you're really enlightened, if you're really loving. Yeah, there are a lot of problems in relationship. And maybe, maybe the solution is to get another one. But in every single case, no, no, thank you. So anybody who was... Uh, None willing to let this group tear them apart, of course, is going to leave. That's why there are no married couples in the Rajneeshis. He believes we shouldn't have children. Well, actually, I'm in, I'm in favor of that, too, at least for a while. Stop having children. There's too many people already. Way too many people. And that makes these, that justifies these draconian actions by governments and other groups to uh, solve the problems. Huh? Just stop having kids. In fact, stop doing everything. Just meditate until you get enlightened. Then you'll know what to do. You won't need anybody to tell you what to do. You'll just automatically do what's right. So, I don't know what I'm talking about. Don't take this too seriously. <laughs> but I'm making counter-propaganda against the people who are trying to fuck with me. And I can do that. I know how to do that. I'd rather be teaching. Huh? I'd rather use my time and energy to help people towards enlightenment. But maybe this is something you need to know to attain enlightenment or to retain whatever spiritual <laughs> value uh, you've managed to create in yourself. So I've said pretty much everything uh, relating to post-enlightenment. So I'm going to take a little break and start a new series a little bit later on. Thank you all for watching.
Thank you very much. See you later.